Okay, so if we go by handout number four, what it tells us is we need to set up a, uh, a, a database and to copy last week's work into this week's folder. So we need to activate our WAMP server as always. From the desktop, double click Start WAMP Server. You should see that on the bottom right corner, it, it opens up a little uh, red W, then should become green. If the, hand, if the uh, W doesn't appear, uh, it might be hidden inside of the little double arrow. So then you want to uh, click on the W and we'll launch phpMyAdmin to create a database. So go ahead and from the from the little W click phpMyAdmin. That should open a PHP My Admin. We've seen this before, and at the very top, we need to click on the databases icon. Click databases. We'll create a new database called WordPress. Remember also to click the create button, or else nothing happens. So it's a brand new WordPress database. So I've got my WordPress database uh, on the side here. <coughs> I've created the database. I then need to copy last week's work to this week's folder. Thank you. Last week's work is in the network folder. So We're going to open the computer window, double-click computer, then you'll open classroom data drive Z, scroll down to find our class which is campus uh, WordPress 2. There's last week's folder of last week's work, 2016-07-11. You need to right-click and copy that folder. And we're going to paste it into the www folder on the C drive. So that means you're going to open computer window again and go this time to the local disk C. And you should see uh, you should see the WAMP folder for our WAMP server. It's alphabetical, of course. You want to double click WAMP. Then you want to double click www. And paste. We copied last week's work from the network folder to our WAMP folder for this week. Next, back in the web browser, we'll go to the address localhost slash 2016-07-11 slash installer.php The duplicator installer window then asks you to fill in these items. We have the name of the database, it's WordPress. We have the user, which is root. Then we have password nothing, or empty.
and you can confirm that works by clicking test connection. You should get a couple of success uh, a couple of success uh, feedback messages. You need to then click I've read all the warnings and run deployment. Once that uh, gets to step two, which is update, you can click Run Update. And again, I'm just following my handout, number four. So I need to save those permalinks, do the security cleanup, and I'm ready to get started. So I'll click Save Permalinks. It asks me to log in, and if you're using my site, then the login is username admin and the password is password. Just to keep it easy, you can use admin and password, which are terrible usernames and passwords to use, but just so that it works. Log in. This is the part where in the handout we should, we should sort of have a footnote in that we're about to save our permalinks with the post name, which is better than the default. But the problem would be that we would also need to activate the um, rewrite module. Remember that? That's one of the new things we did last time. So I'm going to go ahead and save these changes. Well, we didn't, we didn't change anything, but we just need to save it. What I'm getting at is, remember the handout 4A, or 4.2, whatever I called it, now mentions you also have to go back to the WAMP server icon and activate the rewrite module. So you can click on the WAMP icon, Apache, Apache modules, And I'll select Rewrite Module. That should cause the little W to go from orange uh, back to green. And that simply was, at whatever point we need to do it, we need to activate that Rewrite Module so that this permalinks works. We can activate the rewrite module first and then save this, or we can save this and then the rewrite module doesn't really matter. So I activated my permalinks. I'll go back to the duplicator and do the security cleanup. Security cleanup is to delete the reserved files, the old installer files. Click that. And lastly, this deleted these installer files, but it still has the archive, the zip file. The zip file is still in the folder which you need to go back to your 7.11 folder in the in the WAMP folder and delete the uh, and then delete the, the zip file. I'm going to delete that. And I'm finished with the WordPress duplicator 
tab, so I can close that, and now I've got my site. The dashboard is uh, of my site, and it's ready to go. I have my site also up here, everything that I've done with it so far. My menus and all that stuff that I did is, is ready to go. So I'll give you uh, one minute to make sure that's all done, and then we'll go on. Everyone, on, everyone, final questions before we go on? Okay, so the, um, as I said before, the process that we do here of bringing our site back week, week after week is a similar process that we would do when we eventually want to get this up on a real server because we're working on a, on a local host. Eventually, we want to put it on a real host. 
Um, we still have a little bit more to do though. We need to talk about the whole shopping cart feature, so that's what's coming up next. I have a brand new handout for you in the network folder if you didn't see it. Uh, let, me, let me show it to you. I'll turn the printer back on so you can print it later. But if you go back to the network folder now, we have handout number five. Question. Okay, just let me finish my thought here. So we want to go back to um, the network folder, and if you get a copy of Campos e-commerce number five, remember drag that to your folder or your desktop. Don't just double click it in the network folder. Copy that to your flash drive or desktop. Once you copy that over, we'll take a quick general overview look of it, and then we'll actually do what the handout says. But the big idea is that we need to install a plugin, and then once we've installed a plugin, we can start to use it, and there are various settings, and we get all of these cool new features. So we're going to look at this together in just a moment. Again, I'll turn the printer on in a little bit. And then we'll uh, you can get a copy of that if you like. But for the moment, let's do this. Right, so the handout here, this is mentioned in other handouts as well, but notice the notes here about different ways to log back into your site, localhost slash something slash wp-admin. And the reason I say something is because it's going to depend on your folder. Today we're working on a folder that's 2016-07-11. So it would be localhost slash 2016-07-11 slash wp-admin. Um, depending on whatever the folder is. So we mentioned that before, but there it is one more time for you. What we need to do now is we need to add a new plugin. The ability to sell products is not built in to WordPress. It's an extra add-on feature. It's a plugin. That's what, in short, plugins are. Extra new features, extra new like mini apps to add more capabilities to your basic WordPress. So we've added a few plugins before. It's the same sort of procedure. Hover over plugins and then select add new. Before we type what I have in the handout, if you simply type on the top right corner to search, if you search e-commerce, just search the keyword by, all by itself like that, e-commerce, and then press enter. In my case, I get 1,087 items. You, get, you may get more or less. But this whole plugins marketplace is full of thousands of plugins. Here I'm seeing thousand, a, a few thousand plugins just on one concept, the concept of selling products, doing e-commerce. And so I'm looking around, and there's lots of possibilities. They all seem good. So let me take a quick moment to tell you about becoming a savvy plugin user with WordPress, because there could be a lot of pitfalls. And I'm going to write these down as notes, and I will put these notes in the folder at the end of the day. But I'll say tips on selecting the right plugin. Search your keywords or topic for 
a plugin. Remember, the plugin gives you extra features. So if I need new features of Twitter, maybe I want to show Twitter in some special way on my site. I can search on the e-commerce marketplace there, Twitter, and see results. So then in my case, I get a thousand results. Okay, so what we need to do then is, you need to of course read the description. Is it actually what you think you need it to be? Because unfortunately, sometimes the simply the title of the plugin is not enough to tell you if that's exactly what you need. So search, your, search for your keywords, read the description, to see if the plugin is valuable to you. Because out of these thousand results, a lot of them may use the, the keyword e-commerce in their title. And sometimes there are plugins that do something, and sometimes there are plugins that attach to another plugin to make that plugin do more. So it can be confusing. So there could be easily a plugin that's called something like e-commerce add-on to e-commerce cart. So that might mean that it's an extra feature to another plugin called e-commerce cart or something. So read the description to make sure if it's exactly what you think that it is. And let's say you get lots of results like me. To be a savvy consumer about which particular plugin to use, we have these items right here on the bottom of each box. The number of ratings, uh, updating, and compatibility. You should look at all of these also to make your decision. So I'm going to say go for a plugin with many ratings and high stars. You see this one, e-commerce, has a perfect five-star rating. So that means it's the best plugin of all, right? It has one person that gave it five stars. So obviously the, the, uh, the plugin author's mom gave him five stars. Or the theme author herself. So that's not a very good indicator. Only one review. Okay, this one over here has still perfect five stars. 17 reviews. That's much better. Comparing those two, this one might, might be better because it has more people that gave it good reviews. Um, I would still go for plugins that have more, like 100 reviews, 200. The more, the more accurate because I could probably find 17 people that I know to give me a star review. Um, so there are any's over here. 76. Okay, this has got four stars based on uh, 76 reviews, and this one's got five stars based on 17. Just <coughs> with those raw numbers there, perhaps the better one would be this one, because more people have chimed in to say how good it is. 76 is obviously more than 17. 69 and 76, these are very close, I would say. Only seven votes separate them, but it's got a higher star rating. So maybe this one is better than that one. Well, sometimes simply stars is not good enough. Next you want to see how many installed, how many installed. How many people, real people, have installed the plugin and are using it? And it tells you right here. 8,000 active installed. So at least 8,000 websites are using that plugin. This one over here, at least 4,000 are using it. The well, 8 is obviously larger than 4, so the more people are actively using this one. This one that had the perfect 5 stars, this one has more than 20, but most likely less than 100. So very few people are using it, really. 20,000 active installs. That's very good. Lots of people are using it. 
lots of star ratings also, 119, four and a half stars. What you should also think about when deciding a plugin is when was it last updated? Updates. We had a whole discussion last time, didn't we? Why are updates valuable? Remember, we talked that updates are supposed to fix security holes, problems with the with the plugin. People are trying to break into a plugin, break into your site. So when was the last updated? If the plugin, for example, WooCommerce Rejoiner two months ago, um, e-commerce dashboard two years ago, um, Orilla Cart six months ago. Uh, six months is kind of a long time for people to figure out is there anything wrong or broken with this plugin? At least 500 sites have that installed, so that could be 500 targets for a hacker to try to get into a website. Um, six months is a while that this plugin was last updated. If you see this one, updated three hours ago. E-commerce shop and drop right, WP Easy Cart. Three hours ago, they just updated it. 4,000 installations, 76 stars, 4 out of 5. And lastly, you have to see, is it compatible with your WordPress? You might see a plugin that sounds really good and it has pretty good reviews and number of installs, but it hasn't been updated in nine months. I would keep looking. You don't want the liability of, of, uh, of getting hacked. So the newer that it's been updated, you know, ideally less than a month. Three months could be okay, that's, but that's a quarter of a year that someone has spent time perhaps to figure out if the plugin is broken to take you down. You want to make sure it's compatible with your version of WordPress, of course. When you do the update of when you do the core update, um, core WordPress update, that might break an older plugin. Who knows? So taking all those factors into account, we have all of these results. The one we're going to use, if you go back to the top and search, is called WP eCommerce. Search for that. Back up to the top, WP space eCommerce. In my case, I get 858 results. A lot of these have no stars or few stars and few usage. And the top result should be WP e-commerce right there. Notice they've also gone, well, who created this? This is the WP e-commerce team. So anything else besides this one, uh, you've chosen the wrong one. Now it's got, doesn't have perfect five stars. It's almost at four stars, but it has lots of reviews. It's been a little bit since the last update. It's getting to the three months. It is compatible, but look at that, lots of users, 50,000. Now the reason, one possible reason that this plugin doesn't have the perfect star ratings is because think about yourself. How many of you use Yelp? How many of you use any rating system, like giving ratings on Facebook, giving ratings on Yelp, giving ratings on YouTube, giving ratings, <coughs> etc.? Um, a lot of times people are very prone when they have a bad experience to let you know about it, to go to Yelp and give you that bad review, to go on YouTube and give you a bad review. People seem to much more easily give negativity than positivity if they're given a chance, unfortunately. 
So perhaps this plugin doesn't do exactly what someone needs. So they go off and give two stars or one star. Someone else tried it and it does everything, but it's missing one thing. So they say, well, what a ripoff, and they go give it one star, which then doesn't take into account all of the people, 50,000 among those people, that liked it and it worked well and never remember to go back and give a good star or don't care to waste their time to go give a good good star rating. So more people give negativity easily than positivity. So even though this is not a perfect five stars or four stars, it's still a good plugin. Lots of people are using it. Lots of people are reviewing it. And if you go into more details here, you can look at the reviews section and read more what people are saying. So, oh, interesting. Some of the latest reviews are one star. It's interesting. And then five stars, five stars, five stars, etc. So you can see, you can see the breakdown right here. Look at that, exactly what I'm saying. There's a huge gap between people that really like it and tell them, and people that really hate it and tell them. Look at in the middle, almost no room for the middle ground. And again, people that give the negative review probably needed a... Um, look at this, this person is complaining that the date picker isn't as good as the other competition, and therefore they give the whole plugin one star. One little feature of it on how you pick dates was coloring his opinion to give the whole plugin one star. And maybe that's the most important thing for him. And that's perfectly fine, good opinion. That's exactly what he needed. He didn't do it, but he went out of his way to give it one star. Um, this, this first one is saying something about open source, a glitch, no support. So everyone uh, is going to have an opinion um, what's the best and whatever. So this plugin, I'll show you two plugins. We're going to use this one, but I'm going to show you another one because there's more than one way to do e-commerce with WordPress. This is, this is a popular one, 50,000 installations. But here's another one. You might have heard perhaps this more famous one. If you go back to the top and search WooCommerce, WooCommerce, by the Woo Themes team, four and a half stars, 1,600 stars, over 1 million active installs. So many, many more people are using it. Updated three weeks ago, compatible with my version. Just on paper, that seems much more superior than the one we're going to use in the class. And the reason we're going to use the one in the, in the class is because the details, I've worked with both, I've worked with many plugins. But the thing is that WooCommerce is very cool, very powerful, but out of the box, it needs, in my experience, still a lot of setup. You install it, and it's going to ask you, don't forget to install this, and this, and this, and this. It doesn't quite come complete in this one plugin. Yes, it's very powerful, it can do a lot, but it's like getting a Swiss Army knife and it's missing a couple of items. Once you put that all together, you've got a great Swiss Army knife. And WP Commerce, I feel, out of the box, works really well. It doesn't have every single feature of WooCommerce, but neither does WooCommerce out of the box. And a lot of the extra features that make WooCommerce really good are not free. You have to pay an extra 20 here, an extra $30 there, an extra $40 here, here and there. So if you just need some basic things, yes, WooCommerce is good, WP Commerce is good. When you need even more features, then you have to look kind of elsewhere. Notice here, this particular company Bavik Patel is selling a, a plugin to add to WooCommerce to add order printing. So shipping address and label printing to add that on top of WooCommerce. WooCommerce multiple free gift. So if you want to do freebies, gifts, and presents such it doesn't come with basic WooCommerce, you still have to add an extra plugin to a plugin.
one more, Shopify. Shopify is another big famous plugin. I mean, another big famous e-commerce feature. And they've just created a, 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 a uh, WordPress plugin for us because the traditional Shopify, the way it works is you go to Shopify.com, you create an account there, and you set up a store there. You don't exactly use WordPress. You use their system. It's very powerful, very popular, but you, you, have, to, you have to go over to Shopify.com for that. Well, I've already, got a, I've already got a website in WordPress. I just want to add shopping to it. They've got a plugin. Well, it's not that many installs. Two months old. There's lots of solutions. The big ones are Shopify, WooCommerce, and, we, and WP e-commerce, which is the one that we'll use. The good news, though, is that if whatever plugin you install, using it is going to be similar upon, about all of them. On one, I'll install it, I'll add products and prices and all of this, and if then I decide, well, actually, I want a different one, I can get up and running with the other one relatively easily. And to various degrees, I will be able to take whatever inventory and such I created in one plugin and move it to another, depending on various features. So we're going to use WP eCommerce. Make sure it's on the screen. It's the red one. Click Install Now. That's what my handout is saying here. Search WP eCommerce. You should find the one I just showed you. Click Install. After installation, select Activate Plugin. Click Activate Plugin. handout then says when that's done you're going to have some new menu items something in the dashboard we'll look at the, all of these in a moment but something new in the dashboard a whole new products menu the pages you have new pages to work with and under settings we have store settings so we have a lot of new things to work with I install the plugin I get a pop-up that says um, you've installed it, etc. Just click Dismiss. Click on your dashboard at the top left. And on the dashboard here, uh, at the bottom you'll see a new little WP e-commerce box. And then you'll see sales by quarter, by month, and sales summary. If you were making any sales, they would appear there. They'll show you your sales, how many orders you have, all of that information, total income, etc. So that's a new thing you'll see as soon as you log into WordPress. Under the dashboard, let's look at this. If you click Store Sales, obviously very boring at the moment, but this is the screen where you would see all the items that, you were, that you've sold. This is where you can see invoices, see the addresses, and information of, of your buyers, and all of that. You can download everything in one big file. So this is, um, this is the screen where you will see all your sales and, and user information. If you look at WP e-commerce licensing, this is where you will see, for example, to receive automatic plugin updates and to register. Uh, so this is set up for if you're going to have more features added to your um, to your plugin. You have a brand new item here, products. 
If you click on products briefly, we will start to add products in a little bit, but all products will be listed here. We'll be able to add a new product. We'll be able to work with tags and categories, variations, coupons, extensions, adding more features to the plugin. If you back up to pages, look at all pages, you have some new pages. Products page, checkout page, transaction result page, and your account. So this created some pages for us. And if you recall, whenever we create a new page, in WordPress, it does not add itself to the menu, so we'll have to add it to our menu eventually. We've got these pages where our products will show up and all of that. It's not part of our main menu, so it doesn't show up. We'll, we'll need to remember to do that a little later. And then lastly, we have under Settings, Store. Let's look under Settings, Menu, and a brand new item there, which is Store. Click on the Store Settings. And this screen then has a variety of sub-tabs. One of the first things we need to do after we've installed this plugin is to go through and set some settings. Um, this part is boring but necessary because these will be the basic features of your site, of your store. So we'll go through a few of them, then we'll take a break, then we'll look at some more. But what I want to do first is look at my store settings. You should be under general. And first we have to select what's our base country, where are we operating out of. You want to select USA. You can click on the box and start typing USA and it should jump down to USA. State. Choose your state, most likely California, or if you've got some sort of setup like that as a Delaware limited liability corporation or something, you want to set that up. For these things regarding some of these store setup, these basic things, I won't be able to tell you exactly what to do because it depends on what you're trying to sell. But I can give you an opinion and examples of what we've done for clients. Any of these things regarding taxes and localities and all of that really, though, you need to check with your tax preparer, you need to check with uh, you know, the city hall and that sort of thing to fully set yourself up as a store because we're going to have various levels. Uh, you don't have to have like a real business license or a real sort of setup to start selling. You should, because then when it comes to taxes and all of that at the end of the year, you could have a lot of liabilities to, to deal with with Uncle Sam. So I can't tell you exactly what to fill, fill in some of these, but I can guide you a bit. Target market. Where are you selling your product? If you've got some sort of digital product or you are shipping out th throughout the world, you might as well leave all the target markets open. We will be able to accept money from or currencies from every country. Let's say I'm only going to ship to US, Mexico, and Canada. So the way I would do this is select none, target none first to turn them all off because there's like 200 countries listed here. And then go in and select the three markets. So you can put whatever you want, but I'm going to do Canada, Mexico, US. Keep stock in cart for X. Have you ever been to uh, some online store like Amazon, let's say, and you're about to buy something, maybe it's a little expensive, you're about to buy it, you get to the 
you get to the checkout screen and you say, well, maybe I should pay the mortgage uh, this month. So you don't buy the object, actually. And then you, you close your window, you go away, you come back then a week or two later during payday. You go back to Amazon and it's still waiting for you in the cart, enticing you still to buy it. Well, that's what this is about. Keep stock in cart. When a person wants to buy something on your site but never completes the purchase, how long would you like that item to stay in their cart? We have any number of time and then the units are hours, days, and weeks, and you can even put fractions. So if you put 0 0.5 weeks, that'll be, you know, half a week. This is up to you to decide. Maybe you want to, you know, do it uh, two days if you've got some sort of product that you want to sell, because if someone adds it to the cart, then no one else can buy it. And if you've got this one-off item that you've only got one of to sell, and someone is hesitating there and they never bought it, and you put there one week, there's a whole week that you could have sold it, and then eventually they never buy it, and you lost the week of when you could have sold it. So whatever makes sense to you. Don't worry about this hierarchical product category. Currency, probably keep that on US dollars. Currency sign, probably keep it as is. And the separators here, probably keep them as is. If you are selling products in other countries, perhaps you need to uh, put your currency symbols in the other ways that the other countries use and then change your thousands of decimals depending on your locality. When you make any changes on this screen, remember to click Save Changes. If there are any items that I skip, um, don't worry about them, but any questions then on this first screen here, general? Okay, let's look at Admin. Max downloads per file and lock download to IP are related. These are more for digital products. Let's say I'm going to sell some music. So I've got MP3 sounds that I'm selling. Um, what I've got here on the first one, someone buys my song and then they download it and something happens and then they lose the file, their computer gets erased something happens. So I've said it here that they bought it and they can only download it one time. If they then want that song again and not of just an accident they lost the song, do you want to allow more than one download? And again, this is all up to you. I would say possibly three ch chances and then you're out, three strikes you're out, or two, it's up to you, or you know, 99, whatever, let them download it as many times as they want. But if you put it on one, they're going to have to buy it again, and that might annoy them. That might then go off to, for them to go off to Yelp and give you one star review, because you can't buy, you can't download that song one more time. Related to that is here, lock IP, yes or no. I would not recommend to put yes. What this is saying is, uh, I bought this at home. And if I want to download it, I can only download it at my house. What about if I go to my friend's house? And at my friend's house, I buy your product. The IP address is the unique address that everyone has on their computer. So I have a certain address on my home computer, and my friend has another address at her home computer. So if I buy your product at my friend's house, and I try to download it from my house, and you put their 99 downloads, it will not let the person. Because they bought it originally at my friend's address. And I try to do it on my address, it will not let me. This is way too strict because even if I don't buy this at a friend's house, you get an ID from AT&T, or you, an IP I mean, you get an IP from AT&T, or Verizon, or Cox, or whatever. You get an IP. And once in a while they change them. They've probably done it several times and you've never noticed, you've never cared because your internet works. But if you still select this and AT&T changes the addresses of everyone in San Diego, suddenly whoever bought your product cannot buy your product anymore. They don't have the same address. So leave this one. No. Mime type, don't worry about it. Store admin email. Who will get the emails when something is sold, when something needs to be returned, etc.? This should have taken it from 
what was over at the general settings of all of WordPress, so I had there, if you need that to be different. If you need a different person to to get a notification uh, when something is sold, you put that there. I don't believe you can put more than one address at once. You have to uh, have one main admin here. Terms and conditions. Let's say you're selling some sort of product. Let's say we've got Victor's Bakery, so we're going to sell uh, food, and people might have allergies. What's that allergy um, notice that we see all the time? It says, uh, you know, caution this item exactly with peanuts. It says this item is manufactured in a in a facility that handles nuts and and, and dairy products and such. We can put that. We can put that. Uh, these. This is optional. These items are. Uh, manufacture in a facility that processes nuts and dairy. The point of this, terms and conditions, is when someone's about to buy your product, there will be a little check mark that says, I have read the terms and conditions, and a link to whatever you write here. You can write as much as you want. So this is a little bit of legal coverage just a little bit, that if someone buys your product and then has an allergic reaction, what you had said here, you agreed, you, you read and you clicked, you agreed that these items are sold with these caveats. If you don't put anything there, nothing happens. But if you put something here, the person has to click the check mark first. Once a person makes a sale, the, a purchase that is, they get an email. This is all the setup for that email. Uh, you can set up where is this email coming from and the sender's name. Let's say first here, sender's name, uh, Victor's Bakery Sales Team. Whatever you want. That's the name of the sender when they get the email. And you've probably seen you buy something from some place and it's some and it's something like no reply at you know bootworld.biz. No reply at something. This is very common. So let's say in my case, no reply at Victor's Bakery. This assumes well, I guess it doesn't really assume it, because it's no reply. If someone tries to reply, it will not work. But this assumes that if you were going to use a real address, such as help at Victor's Bakery, this assumes you have a real address that's like help at Victor's Bakery. You can have something like Victor's Bakery at gmail.com. So if a person does reply, it'll go to a real inbox, but oftentimes you probably get those notifications that says, you bought something, please do not reply to this email. And about emails here, I would say, don't get one of these free email addresses. Don't get victorsbakery at gmail.com or at outlook.com or at Yahoo or whatever. Don't get one of those free ones. If you get a free one, spammers get free ones. You don't look legitimate. You know, it's always funny to me that these uh, local companies, you know, driving around in their in their official looking cars and such, but then at the bottom says contact, uh, johnslandscaping at gmail.com. If they paid for that car, and the signage all around it, they couldn't pay for an email address such as, you know, sales at johnsgreenery.com. Uh, so for yourself, I'm going to say you need to see about investing in something like that. You usually get an email address when you purchase the domain. Now remind me, did last week we have a discussion, a little bit of a discussion on domain providers, or was that my other class? Did we talk about GoDaddy and all those sorts of things last week or not? Yes, okay. So, when you go buy victorsbakery.com at Bluehost or whatever, most likely they will give you for free at least one email address, or they may, they, or they may sell you a package. So that's going to be much better than the Gmail one. Don't get Gmail. Get a real address. That's professional. You don't want to look like a spammer. Anyone can create a Gmail address. Any spammer can and does. What you could do with this 
what you're setting up is no reply. A person could reply. You could ignore it, or you could actually deal with those replies. The actual body will say, thank you for purchasing with, and then this keyword here that will automatically fill itself in with the name of your site. Any items to be shipped will be processed, so you can change this verbiage exactly how you want to make it say different things. Notice this says, uh, any items to be downloaded can be downloaded using this link. Well, we're not selling downloadable products, so maybe remove this. Where if you're only selling downloadable products, you want to take out the part about shipping stuff. So however you want to edit this, I won't, but again, think about it. What product are you selling? How are you selling it? What message should this get sent to? How should it get sent to them? It'll send them a simple receipt at the bottom here with a, a list of products, the shipping and price and everything. If they are getting tracking information that they, from the product that they bought, that's an email there that they'll get about that, which you can also change. Click Save at the bottom. We're going to skip, well, any questions on the admin screen here? We're going to skip the taxes and shipping for the moment, but let's jump over to payments, the good part. We want to collect payment, of course, for our products, if we're selling any real products. And here are the default ways that we can accept payments. ChronoPay and different, different flavors of PayPal. We can accept payments from other things such as Authorize.net and Stripe, you know, other ways. But the default that comes with WP Commerce is one of these ways. If you if you ever take a look over at products and then extensions, you will see extra features for WP Commerce, such as different payment methods, payment collection methods, the gold cart, Stripe payments, using FedEx, uh, authorized.net, etc. And so here it's $79 edition. If you want to have something like Transfirst, Brain tree, all of these things. So these extra features to to add upon your uh, your plugin. These are over on the products extensions. What I'm getting at is the default payment methods. Not a lot, but PayPal is one of the biggest ones in the world. And by using PayPal, we will also be able to accept currencies from all over the world, and it'll automatically do an exchange in funds. We also have this test gateway. If you open up the settings of the test gateway, that's what's currently set. If anyone tries to buy any of our products, this is what they will see. They will have the option of a manual payment. Let's change that to say test payment system. This is not a real site at the moment. No one will really see this. But if you upload this and forget to change this, someone will try to pay with a test, uh, with a manual payment, which is like that you have to tell them here in the payment instructions, now send us a check at this address. That doesn't make sense. So what we're saying here is this is just a test payment system, and it says, warning, no products will be sold. Test, test, test. So if we forget to remove this part and someone tries to buy, it will, or it should, then um, really alert them here. What will be more tangible is, well, after you make that change, go ahead and update that. But what will be more tangible is 
one of these PayPal methods. We have Express, Standard, and Pro. Pro is not free, and you have to do a, a big old setup. We've got Express and Standard. I'll write these in my notes right here. WP e commerce payment, default payment systems. Test gateway simply for testing. Chrono Pay, I don't have any experience with it, so I can't say anything about it. PayPal Pro, uh, not free, needs a lot of setup. PayPal Express, free but needs setup to function on your site. I'll explain that in a moment. Then we've got PayPal Standard. Free needs the least amount of setup. Keep or uh, take people. Uh, let's say redirect customer temporarily. The reason someone would want PayPal Express is you can keep the client goes through all of the pages of your site and then they go to the checkout and then they're going to get asked for their credit card. If you do Express, the person will stay on your site throughout the whole time. The problem is you're then going to be processing people's credit cards on your site. That asks, that begs the question, do you have SSL on your site? Do you have security? Do you have that little lock on your site up here? Because you're going to be processing people's credit cards with PayPal Express. If you're keeping them on your site, you better have then security to process their credit cards. And that security is not free. Yes, oftentimes if you go buy a brand new account over at Bluehost, GoDaddy, whatever, they'll give you SSL security for one year for free. Then after that, it's most likely sixty to eighty dollars per year. You stop paying for it, no more security on your site. People go to your site to try to buy on, with their credit card, no lock. Are they going to be? Are they going to be wary? Probably. Are they going to say, "Why is this site not secure? It's asking me credit card information. I see the lock everywhere else. What's up with the site?" cancel and go elsewhere. So uh, this needs that setup. You need to buy, I'll say here, need to buy SSL. SSL for security. The next one then, standard doesn't need SSL on your site because what happens is when they click the button to buy, the user will then be redirected temporarily over to paypal.com to a secure page, a very secure PayPal-powered page, where the person there can enter their credit card information, finish the processing, and you never have that information. Your site never sees that information. Your site isn't liable. PayPal is. PayPal processes it, sends the user back to your site, where it doesn't have security, but then the the part that needed it was completed. So to get up and running very quickly, the PayPal standard is the easiest one to do and the one that we'll do because if you if you open up the PayPal standard screen here, all you need to do to set this up is provide your PayPal username, which is just your PayPal email address. Nothing else. No passwords, no API setup, no SSL requirement. You just have to go off to paypal.com, create an account for free, a business account for free. Whatever email you used to create that PayPal, you then just put it in here and PayPal does the rest. 
we deal with the security and everything. People then always ask, well, does a person need to have PayPal to buy my products? No. PayPal can accept credit cards, debit cards, PayPal accounts, everything. They'll process it. You just have to provide your username. So PayPal standard is the one I'm recommending, and the basic steps are basic setup, create a free PayPal business account, provide PayPal any email address, verify in PayPal, and then add your PayPal email address to WP Commerce. And that's it. Done. You start to collect payments. PayPal will process it all. If you want to see how it fully works, you can go off to one of the example sites that I've mentioned in this class, like Yestexcoco, SwapDots, Elsavalencia.com, etc. They use this system. PayPal takes over for a moment, processes it, it's all secure, sends them back to your site. Maybe they, add, they have a change of heart at the last minute and they cancel at PayPal. PayPal will still send them back to your site. The only thing you need to set up here is if I have an email address, I plug in the email address. You could customize this when the person's about to buy. You have various, they have various options to select how to pay. This will say pay, pay, PayPal Payments Standard. You could have it say something like pay securely with PayPal. So you're telling people you're about to pay securely. You don't see the lock on my screen up here, but you will pay securely with PayPal. And PayPal will automatically add a little icon there that has all the credit cards. So people will see that all credit cards accepted credit or debit. Everything else here you don't have to change. All the defaults are just fine. So the only thing really you needed to change here is add your PayPal email address. How many of you currently have a PayPal account? All right, so you're ready to go. How many of you have a PayPal business account? It's almost the same thing. Uh, and you should have the PayPal business version. You can go up on your settings and switch between the two. And there, there is going to be some form of a, a fee, and unfortunately you can't really get away from that. Every um, payment processor has, to various degrees, some form of fee. There's always a fee when it comes to money. When someone's handling money, someone's always charging about it. Really, the only way to get away from it is if you're selling things at your front door, you know, in your garage sale. But then you have to deal with, if you're going to do it legitimately, during tax time. So yes, the stuff you sell at a garage sale should be taxed. That's income. Everything's income. Everything's taxed. A lot of people don't know or ignore that. But everything you're doing here also, selling products, that's income. That should be reported during tax time and such. But the point is that if I set up an account at PayPal or Stripe or Authorize.net or a merchant account at a bank, all of these companies Square, uh, what's that new one? Venmo, all of these new ones, all of these old ones, they all basically take some form of payment somehow. And uh, it could be like a 2% or a 2.5% out of your sale. That's the cost of doing business. When you go pay at Walmart, Walmart is paying American Express for you to pay with your card. Everyone has to pay some credit card processor. So I'm going to make changes, I'll update that, and then at the bottom just to make sure, oh, then you also have to activate it. Just to see how that works, we will have both PayPal and test payment methods, save. So once we have products and all of that, we will, we will then have people see that uh, they can have a couple of payment methods. Let's take our first break. When we come back, we'll look at these other settings. Once that's all done, then we'll add products. It's 7.15. We'll take a break until 7.25, and we'll go on.